Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. And I think that everything was set up uh, just beautifully about why this issue is so important, um, both to the members of the International Council of Shopping Centers, but also to you all out there in the audience today. We have been working on this issue for nearly a decade now as an organization. And um, today I'm here to give you some background on what's happened with this issue, why we are where we are today, and what we can look to do going forward to fix the problem. Now let's take a moment to think back about 20 years. 20 years ago, the web was still a brand new concept. Now most American households had computers, but really the web was restricted to universities. American households didn't have access to the internet. The idea of shopping online was therefore a very foreign concept at that point. It just didn't exist yet. But it was back in 1992 that the Supreme Court heard a case, Quill versus North Dakota. Now that case and the decision made in it had very big ramifications for the retail environment. It disrupted the competitive environment for retailers. And now it is preventing states from collecting vital resources that they need today. But basically what the Supreme Court said in this decision was that sales tax codes vary so much from state to state and locality to locality that it was far too complicated and burdensome for sellers located outside of the state to figure out how to collect it all. So therefore, a retailer must have physical presence in a state in order to be compelled to collect the sales tax on behalf of the state. Now today, let's look at what we have in our environment. We have smartphones that are 50 times more powerful than the average desktop compu computer was back in 1992. Online shopping is a common activity, and in fact, it's so common that we have an overabundance of online retailers from which to choose. In fact, online sales are growing so fast that they're growing four times faster than those sales made at brick and mortar establishments. So clearly we're dealing with a brand new environment and something completely different than what we saw in 1992. So what's the problem here? Isn't this just how competition is shaking out? Well, remember, the Supreme Court ruled that you have to have a physical presence in order to collect sales tax. So what that means is that in today's marketplace, we have some retailers who are forced to collect sales taxes, while others are not on the exact same purchases. Now this puts one group of retailers at a disadvantage. So our current sales tax system is essentially favoring one group of retailers, that would be online sellers, over their brick and mortar counterparts but it's also denying states and localities of revenue that they are already owed. So let's talk about some misconceptions about this issue, and let's do a show of hands here. How many people shop online? Okay, how many people think that when you buy something online, you have to pay sales tax? Okay, how many people think that that is a tax repurchase? Okay, a few hands, maybe some people don't want to admit it, that's okay. <laughs> So basically, this is one of the most common misperceptions out there. If the retailer doesn't collect the sales tax, then it must not be due, right? Wrong. But if that's what you think, you're not alone. Last year, ICSE conducted a survey to test consumer knowledge on sales tax obligations. And in that survey, we found that 64% of consumers either did not know or did not believe that they owed sales taxes on that purchase made over the internet if it's not collected by the vendor. Now, what the surprising thing is to many people is that current sales tax codes actually include something called a use tax. And what that means is that you do have to pay the tax on that online purchase. It's a crazy burden right now that consumers are left with. Many of them have no idea they have this unmet burden, but it's been on state tax codes for decades. It was instituted when the, when the sales tax was first established in the state, and every state with a sales tax has a use tax. But consumers very rarely pay this tax. In fact, nationwide compliance is only around 1.6%. So clearly states are losing out on, a, on this revenue. Now, a related misperception is that collecting sales taxes on purchases made over the internet is somehow a new tax. But again, states already require you to pay taxes on those online purchases. The problem is, is that they're relying on residents to send it in. 
Now another common misperception is that taxing online purchases would somehow be a new tax on online retailers. But remember, it's not sellers paying this tax, this is a consumer tax, we pay this tax. So the online retailer isn't having to pay more in taxes, rather they should be compelled to collect it, collect it just like their brick and mortar counterparts. So why is this such a big issue? Why, why do we care about this? Well, as mentioned before, for states, it's been estimated that in 2012 alone, they are expected to lose $23 billion in this uncollected sales tax revenue. It's a lot of money left on the table. It's a lot of money for, for cash-strapped states trying to, to look at ways to deal with budget gaps and fund essential services like emergency response in their communities. Now, on average, about a third of states' finances come from sales tax. So sales tax definitely plays a large role in a state's operating budget. If you look at a state like Tennessee, more than half of their budget is driven by sales taxes. So that's why this issue is so important, and that's why it hits home for everybody here today. Now that you have some background on the current sales tax system, let's look at the impact that this issue has, not only on the retail sector, but also on our communities. Increasingly, we're seeing businesses such as bookstores, jewelry stores, sh shoe stores that are forced to close. What we see happening is that many brick and mortar retailers are becoming showrooms for folks who go in, learn about a product, but then go online to try to save some money because they don't have to pay the sales tax on the purchase. The problem is, is that brick and mortar retailers are operating on a very thin margin, so having to charge an additional 5 to 10 percent, say, in sales tax, well, that puts a retailer at a significant price disadvantage. The reality is, is that if brick and mortar retailers can't compete fairly, then we will see more of them close. But this issue isn't just a problem for retailers, it's a problem for consumers as well. Remember, as I mentioned before, we all must pay these taxes directly to the state if the online retailer doesn't collect it for us. So how does this work? Basically what it means is that the state expects all of us to keep invoices from every purchase we made over the last year. We look at which company charged us the sales tax, which one didn't, add up all those instances of the ones where the sales tax was not collected, then calculate the amount of the sales tax that we owe, and then we have to remit it directly to the state ourselves. It's a ridiculous burden, and it's unrealistic to think that people are going to be able to figure that out and keep up with it. So the problem that we have, though, is that if you were to get audited by your state and they found that you didn't pay this tax, you're subject to a penalty and a fine for that unmet tax obligation. So the reality is, is that while consumers think that they're saving money by avoiding the sales tax when they shop online, they're actually being exposed to a huge tax liability because the online retailer is not collecting the tax for them. But perhaps one of the most troubling things that some states have tried is demanding purchase records of its residents from online retailers. The North Carolina Department of Taxation tried this a couple years ago and sent a request to Amazon for purchase records. So the idea here is that, say, Joe Smith, Joe Smith from Asheville spent $200 on DVDs, books, and other assorted items. Well, then he would get a bill for the tax that he'd owed on those items. Not surprisingly, Amazon challenged this request in the courts. Now, the courts said that the state did not have the right to detailed information about purchases made by residents, so no titles, no items descri item descriptions. But here's the surprising thing. The court said that the state could ask for cumulative or categorized data, so they, the, the state could know you spent X amount of dollars on DVDs in general, just not which ones. Now, certainly, similar aggressive attempts by states would raise privacy concerns for consumers, and it would also increase the chance of tax penalties for consumers. So consumers definitely are hurt by our current sales tax structure. But the reality is, is that our, com our communities are being hurt by this problem as well. Local retailers serve as the backbone of local economies, and we help revise our, revitalize our neighborhoods. Community-based stores keep workers employed. In fact, one out of 11 jobs is shopping center related. Local retailers invest in their communities, and they're an integral part of many civic and charitable organizations. After all, how many little league teams do you know sponsored by Overstock.com? <laughs> now, local stores are also responsible for bringing in this sales tax revenue that's used to provide essential services such as emergency response to their citizens, as well as drive the economic health of the community. In fact, local stores bring in nearly $140 billion in sales tax revenue in a single year. 
But as less sales tax revenue comes in the door, local governments will not have the ability to collect the sales taxes necessary to support these services or provide incentives for economic development projects, and our communities in turn will suffer. Clearly, the current sales tax system is outdated and flawed. It brings numerous negative impacts on our communities. So how do we address this? Well, several states have taken on efforts to simplify their sales tax codes, because that was, again, something that the Supreme Court said, is that sales tax codes were too complicated from state to state and locality to locality. However, that's not enough. The Supreme Court said that this is an interstate commerce issue. So let's go back to your high school civics class that I know you all remember so well on the US Constitution. Essentially, what, it, what you may recall is that under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, interstate commerce issues must be regulated by Congress. And the Supreme Court said in the Quill decision that Congress is better qualified to resolve the problem because of this. So our solution to this problem must come from Congress. Now, there have been several bills introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate since 2003. But the reason there's been no solution for so many years, in, in part, was because e-commerce was considered too new and too delicate to disrupt and burden. E-commerce market share was so small that many people really didn't see it as a significant problem. So members of Congress simply didn't have the political will to take any action on the issue. Now, however, e-commerce represents about 16% of the whole retail marketplace. Growth in e-commerce sales are in the double digits, while growth in brick and mortar sales sit at about four to six percent. And surely states are feeling this lost revenue made from online sales because those sales are increasing so much. As a result, we see new and bipartisan momentum on the issue. Now you'll get some more information on the specifics on the legislation in front of Congress this afternoon, so I'm not gonna go into that. But what I can tell you is that members of Congress no longer see e-commerce as a nascent market that needs to be protected at the expense of local stores and communities. And they see that states are losing out on a tremendous amount of critical revenue that they need at this time. There's also a broad base of support for many groups like yours who are feeling the impact of this issue. Supporters include large and small retailers, of course, also public officials, commercial real estate companies, teachers, emergency responders, and yes, even Amazon is supportive of this effort federally. You're joining many groups who have come to Washington, D.C. over the last six months to talk about this issue. In fact, many members of our organization are here this week as well. We are so pleased to see so much new activity on this issue this year, and we're hopeful to see Congress resolve the issue soon. With your help, we will be able to level the playing field for all retailers, we'll protect the economic health of our communities, and we'll stabilize much needed sales tax revenue stream. Thank you all for having me today, and I wish you much success during your visits up on Capitol Hill this week.